Hello, everybody, and are we pleased to, to greet you here to our second webinar of the Networking Unit Paradigm Shift in cooperation with the task force of International, Metropolis International. So this is a series of webinars we are offering as part of the pre-conference courses, and we have two working groups, and I'm happy to, to present you some of the members of our pre-working group on technologies, migration, and the future of work. So what are we talking about today in that hour we have? I think what we see and sense all of us that our world of analog work is fading away somehow. So this holds true for highly skilled work. So we are fearing artificial intelligence, for example. Many people are worried about that. We also see and sense, whether it's sensing because we do not know, our world of analog work is fading away from manual work also, for manual workers and the service economy. Here's a picture of such a career service. So automatization is expected to be part of the picture. So this is raising fears and concerns. And we want to talk about this. We want to talk about the new technologies, migration and the future of work. So on how new technologies shape the future of work, especially so in sectors that depend on migrant work. We want to look on automatic decision-making based on algorithms, especially um, on matching mechanisms. We see that integrate migrants into specific segments of the labor market. We want to look on social media and mobile comments, which structure information and change routines. And we want to, we will have a look on international students, which increasingly make use of digital sources and open access media. They prepare for digital working life, of course. So if we look on education, it's always speaking about future labor markets. And we want to um, concentrate on platforms and digital tools um, for recruitment, of recruitment, which will increasingly coordinate and direct workers. So on a global scale, we see platformization, which allows companies to employ a flexible workforce. We have fantastic speakers. The first speaker is Astrid Siebert. She's from the German Marshall Fund. I would say she's one of the leading scholars in the field. So having a very good overview on what's going on, and we will have her first to explain, to give us a little overview. Uh, Professor Chin Lin Pang is going to speak with her PhD student Lin Chen on the situation of African students in China and what this means in terms of digitalization. We then have Ms. Dr. Magnus Andersen. He's from Aalborg University in Denmark and he's speaking about the platformization and career services. We have then a comment by Professor Martin Bach Jorgensen from Aalborg University. He will give us his insights into the topic. I'm sharing this, um, this uh, webinar, so I'm pleased to have you here. How do we want to do this? Each speaker will have 10 minutes, not more than 10 minutes, and the commenter, commentator will have five minutes to comment on the papers. And then we have a question and answer session. I call this Q and A and D, so questions and answers and discussion and chat we could put in here. So we have that session in the end. We will focus on different aspects of why did we choose those speakers. Astrid is going to map international projects and developments at the intersection of digitalization, migration, and the labor market. As I told you, the two Lins, so Chin Lin Pang and Lin Chen, are speaking about the connectedness and connectivity of African students in China and what does this mean for their future working life. And Dr. Magnus Anderson is going to speak about the use of migrant work in platform economies. The discussion is going to um, highlight the main points he sees in the debate. And then we have time for discussion. This is the way it works. And I just would like to ask um, Astrid to come up with her presentation. I'm stopping mine. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, hello everyone. I think you should be able to see my screen. Can you give me a thumbs up if you do? Yeah, we see that. Yes. Perfect. So, hi, I'm Astrid Siebert. I work at the German Marshall Fund. I'm a senior fellow for tech and society. 
and focusing mostly on migration. And I'll turn on my 10 minute timer um, mm -hmm. yes, to be on time. So um, yeah, I will provide a first overview for those who have not really thought about um, how does technology migration and the future of work or the labor market, how does that intersect? And so this is really a brief overview. It's not exhausted, uh, exhaustive list or comprehensive list, but it should you know, help you to navigate around. So the starting point um, where we started to look at that when I say we was the migration strategy group on international cooperation and development. And this is a um, group that is funded by Bosch and by Bertelsmann and together we think about the different impacts of technology on migration. And one session was about the labor market. And so we started to look into that. As Felicitas mentioned, uh, there are of course many, um, yeah, many shapes uh, that technology can come. We have digitalization, AI, automatization, but also robotics, machines. Then you have the wider context of e-globalization, remote work or platform work the gig economy and e-commerce. And we wanted to see, so what changes for mobility, migrants and refugees and what are the chances and risks and where are technologies employed? So really just to get a first glimpse and on the very right-hand side, you see my attempt of, uh, of a migration cycle because you've tried to figure out, well, how can you access this a bit better um, or make it more uh, comprehensive? So, but before we get started on that, for technology, there are a couple of questions to ask, and it is not necessarily always about what, so what technology is used, but also about who is using it or who is centered, whose work experience is centered, and why is the technology used. So whatever you think about these contexts, that's uh, to keep in mind, because it's always about also the power play or business models that are coming into play. Then the same way you look at technology as the driver of change, or is it a symptom or a tool of wider change? Here, of course, you have the issues of globalization or deregulation of the labor market. So that's a new business model. This is the context that, you, that you're maneuvering in. Then where does work migrate to and where the human being? I think this is something that we have discussed uh, already before. So it's not new that we are seeing outsourcing or maybe people working from somewhere else, but it's, I think we're seeing a uh, turbo charging is maybe too much, but we're seeing a new boost to that. And which ma makes the first two questions more, even more important. Then we also have geopolitical realities of wars waging right here in Europe. Um, and we need to see what, what does that mean? What does that do? Uh, the future of work and also the labor markets are not, uh, yeah, they're not sealed off, but they are part of geopolitical realities. So, for example, will we, you know, have more um, semiconductor factories here? Do we need for more workers for that? Um, will we have more energy um, or green energy jobs here because we need to become uh, more uh, independent faster than we thought? And last but not least, technological developments move faster than tech policy regulations. And we really need to think about what does that mean for migrant workers? What's the impact? And we're just moving into that field. So anyone who's watching this, um, yeah, thanks thanks for watching and thinking along. Um, so the migration cycle, first looked uh, now to the mapping, um, looked at the country of origin and here, and we'll hear more about it, so I'll keep it short here from Magnus on remote work, also the gig online economy. Um, this is a difference, you have the difference between online economy, so anything where you do labeling, for example, or uh, um, transcription, but you also have the offline economy, offline gig economy, that's the Ubers or the delivery um, heroes of this world. But you also have a new infrastructure and IT hubs opening up. So maybe at some point, and uh, we, we need to ask, well, is there also, are there also incentives for people not to move? And can this be an opportunity to provide more jobs? And how does that impact development writ large? Then we have also in that vein, uh, thinking about how can you connect IT markets and create migration pathways. There are two um, projects that I want to mention. They're also part of the migration um, partnership facility that's also funded by the EU. One are the digital explorers. It's a corridor between Lithuania and Nigeria. And then there's a Palem project 
It's on the ICT talent between Belgium and Morocco. I put the links in there if you're interested to learn more. But also the questions, of course, about what do we do about the renewable energy sector? This could be a win-win for uh, markets and hence we could create better migration pathways. And then last but not least, the section is always about information and learning and how can new learning maybe also impact um, new mobility. And there are online learning platforms, um, for example, by the BMZ um, called Atingi. So BMZ is our development ministry in Germany. And how does that impact um, the way people can access information and also get maybe credentials or even diplomas from that? The migration cycle also includes transit or camps. And here you see the terminology to use as digital livelihoods, the big question mark. Can you provide also in, for example, camp setting digital livelihoods? And there's the ILO has done some reporting on that and research that's looked into that. Um, the question is, can you earn money with apps? Um, there's, for example, Level Up of Refunite, or there's also a social enterprise called Dignify. They are working with refugee talent in the Venezuelan context um, and yeah, teaching, but also then working with them to provide labeling services and other services for the data science industry. And of course, that's some have question marks on that. Um, you see the question about how are they paid? Is the wage okay? Are the times okay? Um, is this an exploitation or is it an opportunity to, to have first steps into the labor market? Then you also have learning and coding camps um, or projects on that. Again, the question is always, how can you ensure that the skills are connected also to, to decent work projects um, so that you're not just training for training's sake, but also know what you can connect it to. Then the country of destination. Um, there's quite a lot. Um, you see from the pictures, the, the offline gig economy and um, but also one thing I wanted to mention is that you see a lot of AI um, used in HR, so in recruitment. And um, it's no wonder that HR and anything pertaining to how do you recruit people, how do you also do oversight, is now in the current uh, EU draft of the AI regulation as a high risk category. Um, and I'll keep it at this, but it's interesting because how do we ensure also for, as a migrant, how do you know how to uh, yeah, provide or um, start a CV in times when an AI is screening it or mostly screening it? And I'll put some links in the chat later for that. Then of course, as I mentioned, you have here in the country of destination opportunities to work in the online economy and also offline gig economy. Another area that's interesting is how do you recognize skills and can technology help there also from uh, migrants or refugees? There's one attempt by my skills um, to do that. So it's a computer-based competency test um, for informal skills. There's a whole debate going on and not yet finished um, about how to do micro-credentialing. And uh, this is mostly at this point among higher education, so universities that want to transfer um, credits, but also know how to do it digitally. So um, this is an area how that is still in, in evolving, but you still need to know, well, what do you define as a skill before you can digitalize the credentialing of it? And then uh, Felicitas mentioned that the AI matching projects um, where you match asylum seekers or refugees with a place for optimal labor market integration. There are two of those um, that we have looked in, into refugees AI and GeoMatch. Um, the context, regional context here is Switzerland and Canada and the US. And there's one that doesn't necessarily look into the labor market matching, but more into um, how, to, how to match it with areas. And this is a German project, the matching project with areas where, so that people will sustain sustainably integrate or remain in the area so it's not necessarily just about labor market integration we'll also see and have a webinar on that i'm excited about it upcoming um, on e-residency programs or digital nomad visas so we see that migration um, can be can take many forms and you have more than 20 countries now that uh, engage in those digital nomad visas and 
we'll, uh, the webinar, the, we'll look into the impacts on host societies of that, of those digital nomad visas, but also what this means for those being the digital nomads um, in terms of their, um, oh, yes, uh, in terms of their social uh, protection and other um, uh, yeah, supports. And last but not least, you have digitalization and robotization in, for example, the agriculture sector. And this can impact and will impact, of course, also seasonal workers. The verdict is out what that means. In Australia, you have the first fully automated farm, but it's also a question, I mean, that's quite expensive, but um, you have a lot of movement in agriculture itself and where also AI oversight might play a, a role also in, in the workers and monitoring workers time and efficiency. And last but oops, last but not least, um, it's a return, it's only one box. Um, we'll also have a webinar on that. Um, as I mentioned, it's not exhaustive list of mapping, but um, here it's mostly how can the um, countries of origin really re-attract workers in one area where um, some of our colleagues are looking into is the ICT sector, so computer coders who are moving back because they see opportunities in their home countries now again. Um, but of course, there are also a lot of questions surrounding these debates. I think with that, um, I've kept it close to my 10 minutes. Um, hope this was a tour de force, just giving you a little bit of a glimpse of all the different topics that uh, and all the different lids you can can uh, look up and then really poke into it. And this is what we're doing with this group. So thanks to Felicitas and Sophie for, for co coordinating us on this. And it's really great learning. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. I learned a lot. Thank you so much for your presentation, Astrid. Indeed, we have a webinar also on the digital nomads and on the e um, mobility also, which is done by Howard Duncan. But now I want to give the floor to uh, the two Linds, please. Okay, yes. <laughs> Thank hello, you. Hello, hello. Um, first of all, very happy to be here. My name is Chinin Pang. Um, uh, I'm affiliated with both the University of Antwerp and KU Leuven, and I'm here with my uh, PhD student, Lin Chen, um, who is working on uh, African students, right? So we will be uh, doing the um, uh, presentation together. So maybe um, uh, can uh, Lin Chen maybe? Yes, thank you. So um, so what we uh, what we want to share with you is it's uh, actually part of the almost completed work of Lin Chen. Um, and today we're going to share with you um, the uh, <clears throat> use of social media by African students <clears throat> um, uh, in different uh, uh, cities of uh, uh, China, studying in different universities. So um, since she's both affiliated with uh, sociology and anthropology, so <clears throat> her, her, she adopts a mixed method uh, 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 approach, uh, um, uh, blending both ethnography, multi-sited ethnography and uh, ethnography. Uh, in triangulation with uh, uh, literature study. So what are we going to share with you? So we uh, are going to look into uh, the question of <clears throat> how, uh, uh, how can connectivity, technology connectivity, maybe we can go to the second slide, how can connectivity um, help uh, 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 African students uh, to create connectedness, okay? So uh, in terms of concepts, we um, use the term connectedness. Uh, and of course, when we, uh, in the conventional sense, it's about physical uh, being together, uh, this physical interaction, but we are also following the French uh, uh, philosopher, philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy, um, uh, who, who, who argues that uh, as human being, we are not being in person, but rather being common. Uh, maybe go back to the, uh, um, the previous slide. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, so we think also that connectedness can uh, be virtual so that the physical and virtual connectedness, you know, coexist uh, together. Uh, then connectivity then refers to the uh, the more te technological part, the networks of communication afforded by digital technologies. Now, there is a, a very rich literature on the negative outcomes of uh, uh, digital technologies, uh, arguing that we becoming that our 
our desires and we as, as, as netizens are becoming increasingly commodified. Uh, and, and in addition, uh, you become uh, you know, prone to addiction and so on and so forth. So the more dark side of uh, connectivity, uh, on the other hand, I think we can argue that connectivity also affords for opportunities. Uh, to foster human connectedness, and this is really what uh, we're going to what we're going to talk about. You know, to, uh, kind of assessment how this connectivity can actually support the connectedness of African students studying in China, both uh, in uh, on campus in their daily life, but also pertaining to their uh, professional activities. And now I give the floor to uh, Lin Chen to uh, share with you some of her findings. Um, I will start with the background information of how many African students are currently studying in China. As shown in the graph, we can see as China's development has led to declines in higher education institutions, students from the South, especially those from African countries with strong relations with China since the Bandung Conference in 1950s, are increasingly found their way to Chinese universities. The African student mobility in the higher education sector has grown from the number of 1,384 in 1999 to 81,562 in the year of 2018. A story told by Ethiopian medical student Amy, who was studying in China's Shanghai Delta University. He has a difficult scenario encountered upon his first arrival in China. They lose contact with their family when unprepared for the digital divide situation in China. As the digital space in China is divided from outside by the Great Firewall set um, by the government, an internet surveillance apparatus resulting from the authoritarian term of neoliberalism capitalism to block access to several social network websites and search engines um, using IP addresses methods. Um, the African students need to install a VPN or multiple VPN applications on their devices to get access to digital space sharing by the family and friends in the country of origin. On top of the adapting of the cultural shock in real life, the first obstacles African students encounter initially is adapting the new social networking and partially cultural space in, in China. Through the assistance with EV VPN, the African students conduct daily transnational mobility across the digital border of China. The regime of mobility and mobility always define each other. Student mobility from Africa and China encountered the immobility a point of arrival within the digital space as a result of the digital space border and defined as the state of actor of China. However, such digital immobility is then be detoured um, for students in initial actors utilize the information from the active connectivity uh, networks. The digital ties through the social networking websites and applications provides bridge to link and compress the geographical distance from the homeland. Not only does the digital ties shorten the distance between geographics, um, it also shortens the distance to assess for information as well as network of support. The social network application most frequently and widely used by African students in China are WeChat. And through the VPN uh, application, they can get through to WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram, email, and Fiverr. Social media allows people in mobility to bring their friends and family along with them from one place to another. And with such ties, they follow the most updated news in their home country, watch entertainment videos, and listen to their country music through the Twitter, YouTube, and Spotify. In this um, stereo coffee space, they bring their homeland and culture with them. The African students share the characteristics of flexibility and uh, bendability towards the surrounding environments. Although African students and other countrymates are located in different cities and universities in China, 
Then they join together in digital space and deeper connection in real life to reproduce a new home in China. Information sharing is a synchronized across cheap geographic locations and time zones. They found common grounds in their cultural roots, mediating through their mother tongue, such as Creole for Cape Verde, uh, Swahili for Tanzanians, Kenyans, and Amharic for Ethiopian. Some of the students choose to post in four languages at the same time for their uh, social networking sharing post using their mother tongue, national language, English, and Chinese, or other different group of friends. When they are using the social networking in China, there's a um, situation they have to encounter and deal with by themselves is under the surveillance of the China's government on the social media, the African students themselves within the community using their self-surveillance methods to maintain their uh, group chatting on the social media on Chinese side, um, to avoiding uses the uh, sensitive um, words under the political censorship in China, especially during the political term uh, time frame, such as during the plenary session of the CPC in almost uh, each year in March to April, they in China Chinese government will strengthen the VPN, uh, the Great Firewall uh, um, methodology and the algorithm, and the VPN company needs to upgrade it. And there is like sometimes gap for one week or 10 days, the, the VPN will really slow down the process for the African student to uh, uh, assess the, the, the other side of the digital uh, space from outside of China. And as well as um, they would constantly, uh, cautiously choose the content and language to post in the Chinese social media to avoid the, uh, the sensitive term of collective action and protest um, so so called uh, um, under the surveillance of Chinese government by using an other language that not easily be detected in the Chinese uh, media group, um, such as their national language, Swahili or Amharic and um, Ethiopian students group to avoid the detected of uh, automatic translate and from the uh, easiest detected language of English, French. And they also use the other media forms to post in the, uh, the terms, such as um, they use the film short filmings on TikTok to avoid uh, the sensitivity de detection as well. And the group administration of the African students will mail down a discussion if there's conflict going on on the social network group using uh, to maintain their uh, logistic use of their social network and develop into a larger group of African students in China online. And uh, there's a division of function of preference using the social media's platforms online. For an educational purpose, African students will mostly rely on uh, the Chinese uh, social media uh, websites, WeChat, uh, QQ as a transformation for uh, files and using the YouTubes for uh, uh, review their lessons if they're mm -hmm. not really good at the Chinese languages. And the professional use of the WeChat and LinkedIn to find uh, jobs and uh, yeah. you open the style entrepreneurs on the WeChat uh, platform. And in daily One life- One more minute. One okay. more minute, please. In daily life, they were more relying on uh, the social media that outside of the Chinese grid firewall that their uh, entertainment and communications with friends are more relying on the Westerner um, uh, social media platforms such like Twitter, WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook, and Spotify. And uh, last but not least, I'll talk about um, the racism uh, on the Chinese social media and how African students has uh, encountered it and uh, resistant against racism. They use uh, the social media as a platform to discuss the conflicts which happened in during 2020, April 17th in Guangzhou, which has uh, 
uh, between the African community and Chinese community authorities during the pandemic control, the tension, they have a um, great discussion across the social media within the ground Zero group, as well as a large community to a whole Chinese uh, African uh, community group and uh, up to the African amb embassies and ambassadors together has brought up an uh, online protest um, to us, the Chinese uh, foreign affairs, to protect African community against uh, the racism during the pandemic. And as well, they have echoing the Black Lives Matters online movement, but avoiding use the movement that was sensitive collective movements, uh, words in China, but using the Black Lives Matter by using the TikTok themes. And Maybe you switch, uh, go to the next um, slide, please. You lost the, the, the last one. And then you yeah. have 30 seconds yeah. maximum. And they are using other media forms as arts, arts um, platforms using uh, paintings, musical, and as well as stand-up comedies to uh, represent their identity and their roles against the racism in China in empowering themselves as a pan-African group in China as well. So that's it. So thank you. Thank so you so much. Apologies for pushing you a bit, um, but we have a tough time scale here. So thank you about those educational filter bubbles we see taking shape. And I want to invite our last speaker here on the intertwined immobilities, which I think fit very well to what we heard. Just go ahead, Magnus, please. The floor is yeah. yours. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Okay, so I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, okay, so thank you. Thank you for letting me uh, present some of the uh, preliminary analysis that I'm working on together with my colleague, Associate Professor Marina Spang, also at the uh, University at uh, Old Boy University. Uh, so this is basically just a paper that is a work in progress that I will uh, talk about now. So February 26, 2021 was a freezing cold evening at Kong Snuto, one of the central squares in Copenhagen. While we strolled around a small crowd of about 40 people wearing light blue jackets with vault on their backs. The, the occasion for the assembly accompanied by uh, 100, some 150 others in the square, was a strike against a recent change ma made by the platform from company Bolt, which meant that the couriers would no longer receive bonuses for delivering takeaway to hungry Danes during weekends. Due to, due to their employment status as self-employed, the couriers are not subject to any form of collective agreement that are an integral part of the Danish labor market, which means, among other things, no right to holiday pay, pension or compensation. At the same time, the pandemic also resulted in an intensification of delivery work where the light blue bags were almost the only thing that you could observe in the cityscape. But with the proposal to change the weekend bonus, a number of these couriers reached a tipping point and called for a strike. Quote, in recent weeks, we have been driving around in minus degrees. As a thank you, they make cuts to our salaries, said one of the initiators, a courier from Spain, to one of the major newspapers in Denmark, Politiken, a few days before the slide strike. Uh, the curious message was clear. No more pay cuts was repeated countless times as a battle cry the following hours. What, seems, uh, what seemed most interesting to uh, us was that many of the curious who were present at Kong's Nuto, as well as the initiators for the strike, the so-called Volt Workers Group, are migrants from both EU and non-EU member states. In many of the cities, in fact, uh, including Copenhagen, platform companies such as Volt could not exist without the perpetual influx of migrants. In fact, according to an interview with, C with the CEO of Volt Denmark, 55% that works for Volt in Denmark are migrants, and 10% of the migrants does, does 15 to 20% of the total orders. So in this presentation, I'll sketch out ways how we can then understand this intersection between labor migration and platform labor, framing it in a broader transnational migration perspective. So far, the literature dealing with the role of platform labor has focused on either one, how uh, digital platforms introduce more precarious conditions for migrant labor, and or two, how digital platforms make it easier to incorporate and tap into a highly mobile uh, labor force, which makes the transnational migration process more flexible. 
My aim here is to put forward some initial thoughts on how the intertwinement of mobilities on different scales, transnational, national and local, becomes the constitutive factor for the precarity of migrant labor as it produces another set of obstacles and frictions rather than just making the transnational migration uh, process uh, more flexible. So in the paper, we ask how do uh, platform labor foster particularly transnational and local immobilities of migrants at the margins of the Danish labor market? And in short, we argue that in, in the way that we argue that the way in which the migrants are working on the digital platforms and are positioned at the margins of the labor market uh, in reality depend on how they move and how they are moved across transnational, national and local spaces. And, and as a result, we argue that the intertwinement of, my, and of, of these mobilities reflects a, another perspective on the precarious conditions that, my, that platform labor and the digital platforms produces. So to make this argument, we draw on the notion of migration infrastructure offered by Bao Xiang and Johan Lindquist. And this figure shows an attempt to deconstruct the different di dimensions that they uh, argue make up such a migration infrastructure. So applying this fr uh, framework on the empirical case of digital platforms, uh, we can see that uh, the migration we can see the migration infrastructure is established through six dimensions. So the commercial is the yellow one, the regulatory is the gray, uh, the red is the social, the technological is the orange, the humanitarian is the blue, which is absent in the Danish context. context. And then we have sort of conceptualized the idea of the, a professional one, which is the green one, which consists of uh, yeah, the trade union and the educational institutions and so on. So these dimensions consist of both practices, human, non-human actors and particular and have their own particular logics and discourses. And they sort of in according to Xiang Linguist, these dimensions produce what they call infrastructural evolution, where the different logics uh, that the dimensions are working according to overlap, entangle, and collide. So this evolution produces mobility practice in terms that can have be flexible, but also be uh, produce stuckness and hindering a smooth uh, movement from the home of origin to the stand, sending uh, to the uh, receiving uh, society. So uh, to capture this evolution, the, uh, the, uh, the analytical framework of migration infrastructure shows then how the migration, uh, how the migrants are moved uh, to a certain extent. So to illustrate how we do this in the paper, I will just briefly uh, take point of departure in, in one migrant that we interviewed, and his name is uh, Lucas. So Lucas, he delivers takeaway to Copenhagen's hungry residents who have ordered their desired meals with a few clicks on their smartphone. Lucas is a Romanian citizen in his mid-20s and a partner at Vault in Denmark. Uh, he was looking for a more prosperous future than the one he could look forward to Romania, according to himself, and the Nordic countries topped the list of the desired destinations. As he, as he told us, everyone is, friend, is really friendly in the Nordic countries and everyone has equal opportunities. So in 2019, he arrived in Denmark. However, his journey from Romania to then work as a vault courier in Denmark was far from smooth and took a number of detours. With very little money in his pocket, Lucas's first destination was the Czech Republic. There's a wealth of companies here where Romanians use, are used as cheap labor, especially in the construction industry. From here, he traveled to Sweden because he met, as he told himself, he met a couple of Romanians in Czech Republic who also worked in Copenhagen to redistribute advertisements. And they put me in touch with someone uh, with a company in Malmö who gave me four months of illegal work, Lucas explained. And the employer made, also made sure that he got a place to stay together with other Romanians while he was working in the borderlands in Denmark and Sweden, so we would travel back and forth to the area of Greater Copenhagen four days a week. After the four months, he found a legal way into the Danish labor market when he got a working contract at a subcontractor for Dao, another delivery company. And subsequently, he started working as a bulk courier in January 2020 after seeing an ad on Facebook in relation to when he was looking for a place to live in Nørrebro, which is in the center of Copenhagen. So in some, this transnational pathway from a uh, true platform work might not be as flexible as we intend to imagine, even though he is EU citizen from Romania, which would make the uh, migration process to Denmark even more, more smooth than being a non-EU citizen. Moreover, at a, at a national scale, his encounter with the institutional system in Denmark was one of the biggest barriers he faced as he did not speak Danish nor English, 
So in fact, it took him many months to just get a CPR number. As Lucas recounted, I went into Siri, the Danish agency for international recruitment and integration, and tried to use Google Translate, but it was not good enough. I'd written something down in advance from home, and in, in the end, I got my CPR number, but it usually takes two to three weeks to get it, but for me, it took five months. I came in February, and by July, I had my yellow card. So here we also see how the national regu regulatory institutional framework sort of creates hinders for this flexibility that we is normally perceive this platform work to be. However, at a local scale, when he would describe his labor process, look at the, the flexibility of platform work was really important to him. But it was not that he could work when he wanted to, but rather how he works, because he would make sure that he would get shift every day from three to nine. So it would basically be, be like a, a normal, a, a traditional job. But it was rather that he could get more deliveries if he was fast enough. So speed it became sort of the decisive factor for Lucas. And that's also why that he is at the end of the interview stated that uh, do it, uh, that when there's no uh, no orders, he would be like, what are, what are you doing today? And nothing. And then he would just be sitting outside doing nothing and get no money. So the fl fluctuation of orders sort of countered his own idea of flexibility. So darkness was falling back at the strike against all changes to the weekend bonus at Kongsnuto in Copenhagen, the visionet that I started with. Another courier from the platform, Hungry Bikes, passed on the other side of the road with a green bag on his back, while a Volkswagen up with four young people stormed past the square as they hung and said, sent rude gestures with the middle finger out, out the window. Meanwhile, a Volt courier walks around the square with his bike, handing out flyers and at the same time explaining to people passing by uh, who are interested in uh, being interested in the, the demonstration. The Volt courier comes from India and has been in Denmark for more than five years, first as a student, where he also delivered newspapers as Lucas to make a living. He since finished his studies and now works as a courier, also full time, like Lucas. Three young white men on the edge of the crowd ask him what the couriers receive in salary. The Volt courier from India explains that they are not hourly paid. Instead, instead he tries to explain that they are paid per trip. One of the white Danish men cannot really understand the system. He reformulates his question to how many trips he can then get per hour and what it gives him in terms of hourly pay. Like Lucas, he answers the same when we interviewed him. Four up orders per hour, 110 Danish kroner. But the most important thing uh, that the Volt courier from India emphasized, like Lucas, when we interviewed him, is that the platform labor is a way for him to stay in Denmark. So just to sum up in conclusion, what the story of Lucas shows is how the precarity of platform labor is actually is not constituted just because they are precarious, but more also because there is an intertwinement of different mobility practices that is sort of shaped by an evolution of various dimensions of this migration infrastructure. And this infrastructure is conditioned by the regulatory, commercial, technological, and social dimensions that together make up this perception that the platform labor is as flexible as you want it to be. So, for example, Lucas navigates this migration infrastructure in different ways, transnationally by getting into the labor market in the first place, going from illegal to legal, nationally in terms of uh, being employed, uh, being independent, but uh, working more than one job, uh, and in terms of space and temporality, so always thinking about being on the move in the city, trying to maximize time. So this might, uh, this contingent labor that is actually uh, pro uh, proclaimed in Lucas might also be explained why returning again to the strike at Kongsnuto in the middle of Copenhagen, that we see most of the striking couriers being migrants, as they are the, actually the ones who are highly contingent at this form platform labor, while also being one of them, uh, being the most important workforce in order to uh, keep the platforms uh, going. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation about telling us also about welfare states, the organization of welfare states and bureaucracies. Thank you so much. We have a comment by Martin Bach Jorgensen, which I'd like to invite now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liz, and thank you to all uh, for speakers. Um, yeah, it's not an easy task uh, doing uh, uh, like a single comment or, or observation on these three um, papers. I mean, uh, 
they speak into a really general trend that we all uh, they were all seeing now, but you do it in very different uh, ways. Of course, the uh, Qin Lin and Lin, you have a very sort of rich, detailed uh, empirical study of uh, African uh, students in, in China, and now this is working with a particular group of, uh, of gig workers in Denmark, whereas you have to uh, sort of uh, mapping out bigger trends and so on. And uh, so, so, so I guess what I see is also, uh, I mean, in different ways, you also show not paradoxes, but at least the contradictions you also see in this kind of, uh, of uh, development and transformation of work uh, and so on due to um, digitalization. I think one, one, one interesting uh, uh, question to raise is the, is the role of the nation state in, in all of this, because uh, sometimes when we think about this, uh, I mean, the digital transformation is this uh, kind of borderless uh, global world, which also uh, some of the trends that Astrid is uh, talking about hints at, right? I mean, that uh, people become digital nomads, but uh, nevertheless, they still need uh, visas and so on. And uh, and what is shown in both the Chin Lin and Lin and Mounds' uh, presentations is that, well, the nation state actually matches in state interventions and uh, and, and obstacles uh, in very different ways. In the, in the case of China and Denmark, in China, we have uh, sensor and so on and uh, um, different attempts to shut down uh, unwanted communication, whereas in the in Manus's case, it's also something like uh, Denmark being a very digitalized society. Uh, on the one hand, it's meant to uh, to create uh, higher security, to give access to all people. But on the other hand, it also creates obstacles for people coming from outside, like uh, like the example of, uh, of Lucas having to wait uh, five months to get his, his social security uh, card. So there's something. I mean, how how do you see the uh, I mean the role of the, the nation state on this? Then there is the Another issue that has to do with uh, mobility, immobility. Again, you have different takes in this uh, in in your presentations. In uh, in Esther, again, you are I mean you are kind of uh, mapping out also research to be made in the future, right? It's more like uh, like a mapping of um, what we really need to know something more about. But there's also a kind of positivity embedded into at least some of these uh, in some of these trends that it could actually improve many things and uh, give access in different ways and. Uh, perhaps for both uh, spatial and social mobility. Whereas in Mounds' uh, presentation, I mean, it's Didn't more like... Mild in speaker. It's more the immobility that's, uh, that's that focus and not as much uh, the possibilities of advancing uh, human capital and so on, or at least uh, personal skills. Um, so again, that's, um, it's not as much a question, but it's just uh, how, how, I mean, what kind of trends do you see for mobility and immobility in all this? Um, then there is, uh, and perhaps it goes back to the, uh, to this, uh, to the role of the nation state again. I mean, uh, um, this this detachment of the, of the, yeah, of, of the national. I mean, um, uh, perhaps mostly in uh, in your presentation as to this uh, again. I mean, uh, jobs moving moving out, or perhaps even back to the uh, to the countries of origin. But on the other hand, we also see new lines of competition then uh, emerging at the same time. Something like Fiverr, for instance, well, it's accessible uh, uh, for everyone, right? But of course, I mean, living costs in uh, in San Francisco and New Delhi are the same. So if people are actually able to do a one hour job for, for, for five bucks, I mean, it, it means a whole lot of, uh, of difference whether you are living in, let's say, India or you're living in, in the US and so on. So, so this detachment from... Uh, from uh, yeah, from 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 the national and, and and sort of the removal of jobs to to almost uh, everywhere. What kind of new competition lines or also on fault lines can you see also in the, when it comes to like like workers' bodies and so on? Uh, I mean, we all remember uh, pre-Brexit, like uh, the British job for British workers and so on. I mean, what what what, what would that kind of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of of struggle look like in a, in a kind of a digital borderless world, for instance? World, for instance. Um, I actually think that was my five minutes. So perhaps just some observations and an invitation to 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 comment on some of these, if you want. Otherwise, we will also open, of course. But thank you so much, Martin, about your thoughts concerning the welfare state. It's not a borderless world, even though we see a more fluid setting. I would stop the, the recording now and we can dive into the discussion. Um, thank you so much again.